Hello everyone. So in these short sessions, we are going to explain the anatomical basis of certain clinical conditions. So first let us see the, some common conditions that can happen to the area of shoulder joint. And we will go through what actually the anatomical basis of these clinical conditions are. So before going to the details, let us know a little bit about the synovial joints. So as we have the fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints and synovial joints in our body, the synovial joints are most evolved. That is because of its degree of mobility. You know the synovial joints are freely movable. And the factors which are responsible for the free movements are like number one, its capsular covering. The synovial joints got an outer thickest capsular covering called as fibrous capsule. And this will form the covering of the joint and inner to that you have a cavity. This cavity is called a synovial cavity filled with the synovial fluid. And remember, the interior of this synovial cavity is lined by another thin membrane called as synovial membrane. And this synovial membrane may not be present at the articular surfaces. So the bone to bone, face to face surface instead of this synovial membrane we have a cartilaginous pad this cartilage is called as hyaline cartilage that is made up of hyaline cartilage and this cartilage is the articular cartilage and this hyaline cartilage that is the articular cartilage prevents the bone to bone communication during the free movement this this cartilage is flexible and allowing the free degree of movement and remember this hyaline cartilage can undergo ossification in advanced stage group let me tell you a clinical condition now itself because once this hyaline cartilage is replaced by bone or that if that is converted into a bone after ossification so the joint space will be much more reduced so there is a chance of bone to bone communication and that can cause friction and inflammation this condition commonly we are calling as osteoarthritis So let us enter to the shoulder joint. So, so the shoulder joint got another name, glenohumeral joint. So this name is because of its articular surfaces. So proximally we have the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the distally we have the head of the humerus. These two structures are forming a ball and socket variety of the joint. The ball is the head of the humerus and the socket is the glenoid cavity of scapula. Remember the speciality of the shoulder joint is its mobility is more and stability is less. The degree of movement is quite high. This you can compare with the hip joint because the homologous joint of the shoulder joint in the lower limb is the hip joint. In case of hip joint, the mobility is less. That is why the stability is more. But here in shoulder, mobility is more and the stability is less. This is because frequent dislocation can happen in shoulder joint. But the dislocation of the hip joint is comparatively less. So now let us enter to the clinical anatomy of the shoulder joint. That means few important clinical conditions which we are all going through in our day-to-day -day practices. And what I feel is if you have a clear-cut or relevant the basic anatomical background, it will be quite easy to diagnose. And also it will be quite easy to manage the conditions. So first let us go through the condition called as dislocation of shoulder joint. And this is also called as gleno humeral dislocation and I would like to show you this in the radiograph x-ray you can compare the first x-ray this is the normal x-ray this is showing you the head of the humerus and also the greater tubercle lesser tubercle of the humerus surgical neck of the humerus and proximally you could clearly see the glenoid cavity of the scapula and you have the cor coracromial arch everything is here and you can compare this first radiograph with the second one you can clearly see the contact between the glenoid cavity and the head of the humerus is not in a normal line. So here you could notice the dislocation, displacement of the head of the humerus from the glenoid cavity. So this is a shoulder joint dislocation case. And the moment the patient enters to your OPD, you can observe how the patient is walking, how the patient is maintaining the posture. There itself you, can, you will get a clue whether this is a case of shoulder joint dislocation or not. Let us see how. Remember, you can have a look at this diagram. So here it is very clear. You can clearly see three points I have 
used red underline you know why first thing you can notice you can examine the patient first you can notice how actually the position of the hand or the upper lip is the arm region will be abducted slightly and the elbow will be flexed and the hand region will be supported with the other hand opposite hand this is because if this support is not given there will be further the pain will be increased because of the gravity already it is dislocated here further no support from below means so the pain can get aggravated so the patient himself or herself will be supporting the limb with the opposite limb upper limb so this you can notice another thing if you observe if you examine the patient so just beneath the lateral aspect of the clavicle you can see a swelling or you if you can palpate and feel it so that could be the head of the humerus because from its normal position this is displaced downwards and forwards so these things are enough to diagnose or to point out whether this is a case of shoulder joint or not so once you notice these many features you can have a radiograph an anterior posterior view of the shoulder excellent this will be sufficient to diagnose you can compare the normal radiograph and this dislocated radiograph and let us see little bit how and actually this dislocation can happen because there are several factors which are maintaining the normal position of the shoulder joint that means the head of the humerus is kept in place because of several other factors the main thing to remember is the rotator cuff muscles we have learned already the rotator cuff muscle consists of the six muscles like supraspinatus infraspinatus and the teres minus these are sit muscles and anteriorly we have another muscle called as subscapularis so all the three all the four muscles are forming sit muscles so these forms the rotator cuff muscle group and their tendons are fusing with the fibrous capsule of the shoulder joint before insert getting inserted to the greater tubercle greater tubercle so these rotator cuff muscles are supporting the shoulder joint from anterior aspect from above and from posterior aspect so this you could make an idea that from below there are now much more structural factors to support the shoulder joint so inferiorly that is least supported that is why this inferior dislocation of shoulder joint is quite common other factors are like coracoacromial arch so you know this is the acromion process of the scapula behind and this is the coracoid process of the scapula anteriorly and this acromion and coracoid process is bridged by another ligament coracoacromial ligament everything together forms an arched shape which supports the shoulder joint from this upper direction this is also is maintaining the normal position of the shoulder joint another thing the long head of the biceps muscle this is the biceps muscle it's long head and short head long head of biceps passes through the joint cavity okay and this long head of biceps also is an important supportive factor for the shoulder joint okay another thing glenoid labra to increase the concavity of the glenoid cavity of scapula there is a fibrocartilaginous rim a pad that is called as glenoid labrum that will increase the concavity to lodge the larger or bulkier head of the humerus so these factors are important in maintaining the normal position of the shoulder joint in these two pictures you can clearly see the bony parts and the soft tissue parts of related to the shoulder joint and i would like to show you the soft tissue part because the pain in shoulder if that complaint is with us means even that can be because of the soft tissue injury or the inflammation also so here you could clearly see the fibrous capsule and all other ligament structure and coracoacromial arch and also acromial clavicular joint everything you could clearly see so now what is sulcus signs so once you uh, diagnose or once you suspect the shoulder joint dislocation you can uh, examine the patient you can perform a uh, test called as sulcus sign so what is this sulcus sign sign remember first you make the patient to sit comfortably 
and you have to press with one or two fingers at the lateral aspect of your shoulder joint okay and you have a general pulling uh, downwards okay generally you pull the arm downwards remember generally you have to pull don't pull forcefully because already you are suspecting dislocation of the shoulder once you pull downwards forcefully again the severity of the dislocation can go high so to avoid that generally you have to pull and you have to press and feel here once you pull downwards again there a depression a sulcus can be formed and that sulcus will become more and more prominent this is because normally in the healthy joint this part is uh, with presence of the head of the humerus and other soft tissue structures so once this dislocation happen these structures are displacing downwards and forwards so again and again if you are displacing downwards this sulcus will become more prominent this is a sulcus plus positive case this is an indication of glenohumeral dislocation so next condition is frozen shoulder okay frozen shoulder this is also called as adhesive capsulitis so already we have seen the rotator cuff muscles so there are rotator cuff muscles like six muscles and the tendons of these muscles the six muscles are fusing with the fibrous capsule before getting inserted to the greater tubercle okay and these tendons rotator cuff tendon can get inflamed okay and this can lead into adhesive capsulitis so here the shoulder will be with the very pain and stiffness will be there so the pain will be followed by reduced movement of the shoulder joint so movement of the shoulder joint will be reduced in all directions and the most important thing is the patient will be with a disturbed sleep because of the pain the pain will be present even at the night also when the patient is taking rest also so if the patient is complaining that i am not able to sleep properly because of this pain there you can suspect that could be a frozen shoulder case okay and again if it is going to a chronic stage means you can examine the patient and you can rule out whether rotator cuff wasting is there or not where actually you are supposed to examine so back of scapula because in the posterior aspect of the scapula you have the rotator cuff muscles like supraspinatus infraspinatus and teres minor gradually these muscles can undergo disuse atrophy so the muscle wasting can happen so this is a very good picture because you can compare with the normal side and affected side so this right side is showing prominent muscle wasting of rotator cuff muscles so that is an indication of frozen shoulder and remember in radiograph you cannot find out this uh, condition because this is a soft tissue effect that's why better you can go for mri again we have a picture or i think already we have explained these pictures like supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor and subscapularis here also on right side also supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minus minor and subscapularis will be in the anterior aspect all these tendons are getting inserted to the greater tubercle and these tendons can get fused with the fibrous capsule before insertion this is the deltoid and this is the axillary nerve relation to the shoulder joint once inferior dislocation of shoulder joint happened there is a, there is likely to get injury of this axillary nerve and sometimes even in the fracture of the surgical nerve of humerus because this is closely related to the surgical nerve of humerus and this nerve is mainly supplying to the deltoid so once this nerve injury happens the actions of the deltoid will be lost deltoid can get paralyzed what is the action of deltoid abduction up to 90 degree 15 degree to 90 degree abduction that is the main action of deltoid muscle so quickly let us go through the other ligamentous structures like coracoacromial ligament we have okay so uh, that will form the coracoacromial arch and also transverse humeral ligament transverse humeral ligament will be bridging the bicipital groove in this picture i cannot show you then we have glenohumeral ligaments and glenoid labra these already we have seen the supportive factors next is painful arch syndrome so here the anatomy of coracoacromial arch that is what you have to go through so
So there are two bony pieces and a ligament structure. The bony pieces are acromion process posteriorly and the coracoid process anteriorly. Bridging the two structures, you have a ligament. This is called as coracochromial ligament. Everything together forms an arched appearance above the shoulder joint. And you know, sometimes this arch can undergo painful situations. You know why most common uh, conditions are subacromial spur and calcified arch. Identify the acromion process here. So just in the inferior aspect of the acromion, a bony spur can grow. And sometimes this tendon, acromio uh, coracochromial ligament, not the tendon, ligament also can undergo calcification. What will happen if calcification happen here, you know? Just beneath this coracochromial arch, you have the bursa, subacromial bursa. That calcified pieces can repeatedly irritate this bursa and bursitis can happen. Bursitis can happen. I would like to show you the radiograph for this condition. This is the radiograph to show you this condition. You can have a look. This is the normal radiograph. Everything is intact. But you know, this is the acromion process. Could you see a small bony growth from the lower aspect of acromion? This is called as acromial spur. Calcaneal spur in the ankle region, we are all familiar. But we are supposed to think of once the patient is coming to you with the shoulder pain, simply you can have an x-ray, normal anterior posterior view of the shoulder, that will tell you several things. Any bony pathology, bony abnormalities are there, means you can rule out and you can tell the patient. So this is called as acromial spur. Sometimes this part will be present even in the ligament also, coracochromial ligament also. So that means that ligament is undergoing uh, calcification. That also can cause irritation to the bursa and that will lead to bursitis. Okay, so you can clearly compare this. This is subacromial spur. Next is osteoarthritis of the shoulder or OA shoulder. This is also called as glenohumeral OA. And here, you know, as we have seen, the head of the humerus is covered by the hyaline cartilage. Glenoid cavity also will be covered by the hyaline cartilage. But sometimes in advanced age group, this hyaline cartilage is undergoing ossification and that also will be converted to bone. So, bone to bone connection can happen because joint space is very narrow, very minimal. That is why friction can happen during movement. This will result in the osteoarthritis condition. And you can clearly see osteophyte formation also will be there. So, the mobility will be restricted. And other findings like the pain will be aggravated towards the evening. Morning, the pain will be subsidal or will be less. And towards the evening, the pain will be aggravated. This is a common feature of the osteoarthritis. And again, these radiographs are telling you the clear. Here you have the normal joint space. After ossification of the cartilages here, the joint space is much more reduced. That will result in the osteoarthritis of the shoulder. So next is another joint pathology also can happen in the shoulder region. That is the acromioclavicular joint. That is another uh, small joint. Remember that joint also can get inflamed, but remember this can happen even in the youngsters also, especially occupationally if the patient is uh, taking a heavy load in the shoulder. So that can happen. This is uh, the, uh, the, in this arthritis, that is the arthritis of acromioclavicular joint. So there will be pinpoint tenderness will be there. Exactly in anterior aspect, acromioclavicular joint region, if you palpate, the pain will be aggravated and the movement also will cause aggravation of the pain.